In this section, we're going to start looking at phonology. And so I'd like to begin by just taking a very brief look at what we mean by phonology. I'll cover quite a lot of uh, aspects of phonology in the next 10 minutes, but obviously we'll be looking then in detail at each one. In this particular section, we're going to be looking at individual sounds, but we'll go on to the other aspects later. Okay, phonology. What do we mean? Phonology is the study of the sound systems of particular languages, so in our case, English. And the first aspect of that is what's called segmental phonology, which is the study of the individual sounds, individual sounds, individual segments, which are known as phonemes. So if I take a sentence like, you should have told John before you told Helen, for example, okay, in the first word, you, we've got two phonemes, y, u. In the second, we've got three, sh, u. And, uh, and we'll look in detail at the definition of phonemes uh, later on in the section. However, if I put um, my phonemes into words and then the words into sentences, and then I'm saying that in normal conversation, what I don't get is you, you, you should, should, you, the, have, the, have, okay, and so on. I get something like, you should have told John. The phonemes disappear, they change quality, okay, once you actually combine them and put them together. And the study of um, elements over the uh, individual phoneme is called suprasegmental phonology. So here, for example, what's happening? You should have told John before you told Helen. In the word have, the h and the v have disappeared completely, and the a has changed to an e, which is joined on to should, should have. You should have told John. In told, the d has disappeared. So we get told John. You should have told John. This is due to the rhythm of English, which is what is called a stress-timed language, meaning that um, the Rhythm is determined by the number of stress syllables in the sentence and all the other syllables sort of get squashed up in the middle. Over and above that though, we've also got the stress and the intonation patterns. This is also part of suprasegmental phonology. So I certainly wouldn't say you should have told John, etc, etc. I'd say something like you should have told John after you told Helen. Or, you should have told John after you told Helen. Or, you should have told John after you told Helen. Something like that. And the meaning of each sentence changes completely depending on where the stress is and what type of intonation there, there is. Now, why is all this important for teaching? Is it important? In a lot of classrooms, and even in a lot of textbooks, phonology is ignored completely. There's no focus on it whatsoever. So, do we actually need to be teaching all this to our students? Well, I'd like to argue that there are two ways in which it's important. The first is that it's very important receptively. If our students are going to be speaking to native speakers, and I agree that there are some who, for whom this is not the primary aim, but if potentially our students are going to need to understand native speakers, they're going to need to understand uh, the sort of features that we've been talking about. They're going to need to understand not only the individual sounds and the fact, for example, that cat and cut are two different words, but also the features of connected speech and of stress and intonation that I've been talking about before, about previously. However, we'll leave that until we look at teaching listening and then look at it in detail. What about productively? What's our aim for our learners in terms of their level of pronunciation, their uh, competence in pronunciation? Audiolingualism would have said native speaker competence, 
learners should be aiming to sound like native speakers. I think very few teachers would um, state that as their aim nowadays. A, because I think we've started to think that, well, maybe it's just not feasible. Research, for example, into whether there's a critical age where neurologically the brain just can't cope anymore with uh, assimilating new sound patterns and so on, could suggest that uh, certainly for those of us teaching older uh, teenagers, adult learners, um, we, we just can't expect uh, students to get to that level. But even if we could, even if we can, is it actually desirable? Language and uh, pronunciation in particular are very, very much bound up with your identity. If you take a child, let's say a boy with southern British parents from London, let's say, who have moved to Sheffield in the north, that child will grow up with a northern accent. Why? Because he identifies with the local kids who are his peer group and he wants to be part of that group. And so his accent is a sort of proof of his identity. By the time we're adults, our identity is more or less fixed. And very often we don't want to change it. As a British speaker of Italian, I don't particularly want to sound Italian. I don't want to sound comically British, but on the other hand, I'm quite happy for people to listen to me and realise that I'm not Italian, because that's me. And I think a lot of our learners feel like this as well. Now, for me, it's a conscious thing, and for many learners it may well be even a political statement. As English becomes more and more dominant as an international language, uh, that dominance is often seen as a sort of neo-colonialism, uh, that it's actually trying to take over from other languages and other cultures and so on. Well, I don't think personally that that need necessarily be so, but certainly if we're going to insist on a uh, native speaker, or all of our learners sounding like native speakers, then I think we're very open to that sort of accusation. After all, even amongst native speakers, there are plenty of regional varieties uh, of pronunciation. So why not international varieties of pronunciation? Why not Italian English and uh, uh, Japanese English and so on? So for most of our learners, I think what they'll actually be aiming for is not anything like native speaker competence in pronunciation, but in what's often called functional intelligibility at, uh, in international communication at an international level. Now, what does that, this actually mean? How close to a standard version do learners actually have to be in order to be intelligible to, to others? Um, that question will be partially answered by some of the reading that you're going to be, be doing. However, I would just point out that first of all, it is going to depend on what language group we're talking about. Some language groups will have far more difficulty uh, even with just something like individual sounds than others. If you're teaching Spanish or Korean learners, for example, you would expect to have to spend a lot more time on individual sounds than with Italians who have relatively little problem. So, that's a very, very brief overview of the areas involved in, in phonology. Uh, we'll be looking at individual sounds in this unit, and then as the course goes on, we'll be dealing with the other issues.